Hey guys, welcome to another World Audiobooks. In case you can't tell, the sound is a little different. I'm so excited. This is a brand new microphone, and I love how it sounds. So doing this uh, little bonus episode for you was a great way to test out this mic, which I love how it turned out. It sounds so good on this new mic. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you think that it sounds different, if you like how it sounds, let me know. Love to hear from you. So today, as you can tell, this is a bonus episode from a friend of mine who uh, I met on Twitter. Again, I love connecting with any authors on Twitter. His name is Doug J. Cooper. He's an indie author who was gracious enough to allow me to read this little prequel that he wrote for his readers. As you'll hear in a minute, this is kind of an introduction to some of the characters and a bit of the storyline to kind of whet your appetite for his uh, book series. If you like crazy awesome space stuff and spies and all that sort of thing, then you are in for a treat. I hope you guys really enjoy this bonus episode. I bring it to you in two parts. So you're getting uh, the first part of the Crystal Horizon here today, and you'll get the next part of it tomorrow. So make sure to stay tuned for that. And uh, if you enjoy it, make sure to let Doug know. He's on Twitter, and I'm putting the links down below, as well as the link to where all the books are. So you can go to crystalseries.com, and that's a great place to connect with Doug and, and see all the other books that he's written. In case you haven't heard any of the previous bonus episodes that I've done, basically what I'm doing is just connecting with indie authors on Twitter and then asking them if, if they would have you know, a short story or like a couple sample chapters, or like in this case with Doug, a, a prequel little book for me to present to the listeners. So it's a great way for me to connect you with new indie authors that you might enjoy reading, because I'm assuming if you listen to this podcast that you also like reading, these two usually seem to go together pretty well. So that's kind of what this is all about, is just to introduce you. So make sure that you go over there on Twitter, or wherever else you can connect with Doug and just tell him that you heard about him on Another World Audiobooks. It makes a huge difference. And now without further ado, I give you the first part of Crystal Horizon. Crystal Horizon by Doug J. Cooper. A short prequel to Crystal Deception. Narrated by Brady Smith. About the prequel. Hello and welcome. I like stories about people, and I particularly enjoy it when these people are engaged in adventures with aliens, spies, artificial intelligence, romance, and battles in space. But then again, who doesn't? Crystal Deception is a science fiction thriller that includes everything from my list above, and this work, Crystal Horizon, is a prequel to that book. I wrote this short piece with two thoughts in mind. One was to give new readers a no-cost opportunity to sample the larger story and meet a couple of the characters from the series. Perhaps you'll enjoy yourself so much you'll want to read the full-length books. My second reason was to give the current fans the backstory on Sid and Cheryl. This prequel takes place five years before the time of Crystal Deception, where we meet Cheryl as a captain of a military space cruiser, and Sid as a covert warrior for the Defense Specialist Agency. We learn in Crystal Deception that Sid and Cheryl have a shared history, and, in particular, a romantic relationship that has somehow gone awry. In this prequel, we join them on the day they first met, and we experience the history with them. I hope you have as much fun reading this mini-adventure as I did writing it. Enjoy. Doug J. Cooper P.S. For more about the Crystal Series books, please visit www.crystalseries.com Crystal Horizon Sid climbed the steps of the aging fitness center, and a shadowy flicker caused him to look up. Squinting, he contemplated the massive Kardish vessel, small to the naked eye as it passed overhead in its orbit around Earth. Huge, silent, Lingering, the alien spaceship had been a fixture in Earth's sky for the past fifteen years. The Kardash had never done anything threatening or aggressive. In fact, it was their silence that made Sid wary. His intuition screamed that they would someday transition from visitor to enemy. He couldn't see a different outcome. And that's why he'd accepted an invitation to attend Fleet's Talent Development School, a place called Camp by those who knew of its existence. Stepping through the door at the top of the steps, a muscular instructor in a too tight t-shirt caught Sid's eye. Welcome to camp, Lieutenant. The instructor tapped a locker with his index finger. Get in the pads and move out to the floor. It was his first day at the elite facility, and Sid took his time changing so he could absorb the rhythm of the place. He dressed in the flex suit he found in the locker, then touched his toes, rotated his torso, and stretched his arms to confirm that the protective pads gave him a full range of motion. As he passed from the locker room out into the large hall, the same burly instructor handed him a wooden pole as long as he was tall. You're with her, he told Sid, nodding toward an attractive woman wearing similar gear. He pointed to an area on the far side of the room. Take that spot, warm up a bit, you'll be sparring with each other in a few. Sid and his sparring partner looped around the outside of the room to avoid the waving sticks of those who'd arrived ahead of them. They'd reached their destination and turned to face each other. 
Hi, I'm Cheryl. He nodded politely but remained silent, studying her calm resolve as she squared up in front of him. He judged her to be in her late twenties, same as him, and he could see enough of her face and figure through her pads to conclude that she was not only pretty, but also had the tight body of a natural athlete. She held a stick in one hand like a spear, and her unpretentious manner disarmed him. It's her first day, too, he thought. Go easy on her. The instructor clapped his hands. Let's spar, folks. Work up a sweat. Convince me that it's real. Cheryl threw some swats and jabs at Sid, and he blocked her stick in a series of practice moves. The physical activity warmed his tall, broad-shouldered frame, and he welcomed the sensation. Sid's priority was to learn everything he could about camp, so he went through the motion of defending himself while he scanned the room with his peripheral vision. He saw Captain Dooley chatting with a couple of instructors and stopped his visual sweep to watch. Cheryl goaded him for his lack of effort. Come on, sport. Are we fighting or dancing? When he didn't respond, she slipped her hands together at one end of the stick and swung it at his head, much like she was swinging a bat at a ball. As the stick accelerated, he heard a growl from the back of her throat. Amateur, he thought, disappointed with her tactic. He timed the stick's motion and, dropping his chin, ducked forward so it would swing by overhead. Her momentum was about to expose her midriff, and he'd use the opening to execute a takedown-and-kill sequence. As the arc of her swing developed, she pivoted her stick while maintaining the power behind its motion. In rapid sequence, she twirled, dropped to one knee, and lowered her shoulder to protect her midsection. Her stick veered down on a new path, and she swept his legs out from underneath him. By the time Sid realized what was happening, he was flat on his back. I got suckered, he thought, scolding himself. He looked up from the ground and saw her smile. I am so sorry, champ. She mocked, projecting a lightness that suggested humor. Hopping up, he reassessed both her and his strategy. He didn't give a moment's thought to the fact that she'd dropped him in front of a crowd. Instead, just as he'd done at the beginning and end of more than a thousand sparring bouts, he brought his feet together, pressed his hands to his thighs, and bowed at the waist. He wasn't surprised when she returned the formal gesture. She assumed a fight-ready stance, crouching ever so lightly as she centered her body over her feet. Shifting the stick to her side, she held it parallel to her body, one hand next to her waist, and the other one up near her shoulder. He'd trained hard for more than a decade on a variety of martial arts and other fighting forms, and recognized her classic bojutsu stance. Adrenaline spilled through his veins, causing his skin to tingle. This is gonna be fun, he thought. He assumed a ready stance that was not identifiable to any particular school or style, but anyone watching would have no doubt he was proficient with hand-to-hand -hand combat and a staff weapon. They began to circle each other. A hush developed in the room as the pair drew attention. Everyone, including Captain Dooley, drifted in their direction and formed a ring around them. Neither Sid nor Cheryl noticed. The muscular instructor appeared between them, raising his hand high to stop their movement. He looked at Sid and caught his eye. Turning to Cheryl, he did the same. After a brief pause, he called, Ready? Then, dropping his hand in an arc between them, shouted, Fight! Cheryl leapt forward and unleashed a lightning-fast attack sequence. The air was filled with a click-clack staccato of impacting sticks as Sid struggled to block and parry the onslaught. He retreated several steps during her opening flurry to protect himself from her weapon. He soon deciphered her patterns and methods and fell into an easy rhythm, alternating between attack and defense. During the bout, Sid landed several sharp jabs to the pads on her chest, stomach, and thighs. His own suit protected his shoulders and forearms from more vicious slices. Not bad, he thought, having met few opponents who could touch him in this sport when he was fully engaged. The battle raged for twelve minutes, then the instructor appeared and yelled, Break! to end the bout. Both dropped their guard and bowed again. Sid leaned on his pole and took a deep breath. Cheryl sat on the floor and sucked in air. Still breathing hard, she lay back on the ground and splayed her arms wide. Nice work, Slick. She smiled for the second time. He sat next to her and continued his recovery. I'm Sid, was all he could think to say. The next morning, Cheryl swam into the tube-like entrance of an underwater obstacle course. She wore space overalls that had been modified with foot fins, added to give the swimmers greater agility in the liquid environment. Putting herself through the lake water, she advanced into a labyrinth of looping and intersecting tunnels. Colorful geometric shapes, boxes, balls, cylinders, and cones were attached above, below, and on either side along the passageway, providing handholds and hiding places as far as she could see. With her calm disabled, she heard only the background thrum of filters keeping the water clear. Sid, her partner from yesterday's sparring bout, trailed behind in a gold-colored suit that matched her own. He swam up next to her and, using hand gestures, signaled that he was taking the leftward path at the intersection up ahead. She nodded and signed that she'd go right. 
She smiled encouragement through her clear hood, but he'd moved ahead and didn't see. Other teams were spread out through the maze, and the challenge they all faced was pretty much a kid's game. The last team standing at the end of the exercise won the bout. Everyone in the game had a short baton as their only weapon. If she touched an opponent's head or torso with the tip of the baton, their suit would glow, confirming their quote-unquote death. I'm not sure splitting up was such a good idea, she thought as the branch she was in channeled up a level. She quickened her pace, anxious to rejoin Sid so they could protect each other. At the next corner, the tube continued up yet another level. Cheryl looked back the way she'd come, hesitated, and decided to keep going forward. A movement through slits in the tube wall attracted her attention. Peering through a narrow gap, she looked into a largish, open chamber that served as an intersection for several passageways. Her senses were on edge. She watched as the two members of the red team swam into hiding places among the obstacles scattered around the walls of the chamber. Nice place for an ambush. She studied the different features of the intersection, so she'd recognize it if she ever made it to that location. A flash down a tube on the far side of the open space lifted her gaze. Something yellow was advancing toward the chamber. Squinting, she studied the object and felt her pulse quicken. The color was more gold than yellow. Sid swimming into the trap! Cheryl controlled her breathing and willed her heartbeat to slow. With confident, focused movements, she kicked and pulled herself deeper into the maze. A fork came into view, and she swam left. After another turn, the passage brightened from light coming up through a hole in the tube floor. Edging up to the lip of the hole, she peered into an open area. The chamber. The red team members were barely visible in the recesses bracketing the tube where Sid would emerge. From her vantage point at the top of the compartment, she couldn't see her partner. Using her memory of his position and progress in the tube, she made a guess as to when he would appear. The challengers, focused on the tube holding Sid, had their backs to her. Pulling herself through the hole and into the chamber, she positioned her feet against the edge of the opening and drew herself into a tight ball. Her instincts told her it was time to go. With her arms pressed against her sides, she extended her legs and pushed as hard as she could, flying into the top of the chamber. The resistance from the water slowed her to a drift before she drowled three body lengths. Damn it. Stroking and kicking, she descended behind the red team, watching to see if her flailing limbs attracted their attention. When she was level with them, she turned and approached cautiously, studying their backs for any sign that would indicate awareness of her presence. She'd made her way most of the way across the chamber when Sin poked his head out of the tube. The two reds attacked. Cheryl felt a moment of relief when Sid somehow broke into the open chamber without being eliminated from the challenge. Swimming forward with her baton out in front of her, she watched for an opening that would let her engage the opponents and help Sid. He had the two reds on the defensive, and, as she approached, she sought a pattern in his action so she could time her strike. The water provided so much resistance to movement that the fight played out in a slow-motion dance. Punch. Kick. Block. Block. Trying to catch Sid's eye, she sidled up behind the nearest red. She chose to act, and snapping her arm out, touched the opponent on the side of his torso. His suit glowed, and as he turned his head to glimpse his vanquisher, he dropped his hands and disengaged. The glow of the light caused the other red to lose his concentration for a brief instant, and Sid used the opening to eliminate him from the game. Swimming over to Cheryl, Sid gave her a one-armed hug. As they rotated together in a circle and looked into the tubes, he leaned his hood against hers and yelled, Nice work, partner. This is a good spot. Let's hang out here and wait for our prey. Over the next hour, they ambushed the orange, green, and blue teams. They waited for a bit, agreed they won the challenge, and worked their way to an exit. Swimming into the open lake, Cheryl's calm activated. You two aren't done. She recognized Captain Dooley's voice. There's still another team. Sid, apparently having received the same message, canted and using strong strokes, swam back toward the tunnel. Her gaze shifted to activity past where he'd just been. Two people dressed in black suits separated from a group and entered a tube farther along the maze. Clenching her jaw, she swam hard to catch Sid. He was deep in the labyrinth when she got close enough to tap his leg. Pulling up next to him, she leaned her hood against his. The black team is camp instructors. We're being set up. Sid nodded. I saw. Let's go to our ambush room before they do. Cheryl's arms ached as she worked to match Sid's pace. She breathed a private sigh when they spilled into the open chamber. Giving her another one-armed hug, Sid touched Hood's. Which tube will they come through? Trusting her instinct, she pointed. There. I agree. How about me there and you there? She said, choosing the tubes on either side of the one they'd agreed would deliver the instructors. Sid nodded, released his hold, and swam toward one of the passageways she had identified. Cheryl swam to the other. Pulling herself about ten body lengths deep, she turned to assess her view. Too far, she thought, when she realized she couldn't see into the tube where the instructors would appear. Hugging the tube wall to get a better viewing angle, she edged toward the chamber. 
Satisfied with her position, she looked across the open space, and, perplexed by the sight, scrunched her eyebrows. Sid had positioned himself at the opening of his tube with his head protruding into the chamber. He may be able to see them better this way, but they can see him too. She waved her hands to catch his eye, but he either wasn't looking or chose to ignore her. Then, her heart rose in her chest. Sid opened his suit, wriggled his way out into the open water, and, dressed only in his shorts, swam into the chamber. You're mad, she thought. There was no air pockets anywhere that she could see. He moved along the chamber wall and positioned himself above the tube where the instructors would appear. She started counting seconds in her head. He can hold his breath for maybe two minutes. She reached twenty in her count when the two instructors popped into view. They moved without hesitation, dashing for Sid's gold suit lying in the adjacent tube. Sid caught them both by surprise, dropping behind them and quote-unquote killing them in rapid succession. One of the instructors swung his elbow when Sid's baton touched his abdomen. Arguably the instinctive reflex of a trained combatant, his elbow caught Sid on the side of the head. Sid went limp and began to drift. The two instructors, engaged in an angry exchange that included finger-pointing, didn't seem to notice. Cheryl watched her partner's motionless body for a full heartbeat before she reacted. Straining every muscle, she raced through the water in his direction. Her body screamed in protest as she struggled to increase her speed. Reaching Sid at the one-minute mark, she got behind him, wrapped her arms around his chest, and, kicking and pulling, tugged him toward his suit. Small relative to the big man, and hindered by her space coveralls, she moved him at a crawl. He hadn't exhaled, yet, and she knew that the air in his lungs was his only resource for survival until she could get him to his suit. Her frantic efforts attracted the attention of the two instructors, and her hope grew when they rushed to help. They hooked arms with Sid's lifeless body and pulled with practice efficiency. Swimming ahead, she lifted her suit and exposed the emergency mouthpiece tucked beneath the front collar. The moment he was near enough, she pried open his jaw, slipped the air tube into his mouth, and pinched his nose. Eyes closed, he drifted without moving, edging her toward panic. Come on, Sid. She moved behind him, wrapped her arms around his chest, and tightened in a short, hard squeeze. Repeating the motion, she appealed to the instructors with her eyes. Help me! With a third squeeze, Sid convulsed. Bubbles burst from his mouth, and then his chest rose. He inhaled, then inhaled again. His eyes fluttered, and she exhaled a breath she hadn't realized she'd been holding. She studied his face as his eyes focused. Seeing her, he formed a broad grin around the mouthpiece. Relief washed through her when she understood he was out of danger. Resuscitated to the point where he could assist with his own rescue, Sid wrapped his arms around his suit and let the instructor help him down the tube and out of the maze. Cheryl followed. For the second time that day, her calm activated when she emerged into the open water. You're the first team to beat the maze since I arrived at camp 20 years ago, said Dooley. Let's see if you can continue your success in the weeks ahead. Yes, sir, she replied. Looking up, she watched Sid and the instructors disappear into the glistening diamonds at the sunlit lake's surface. She followed, trying to decide if her partner was brilliant, crazy, or stupid. Cheryl stopped in the doorway and scanned the briefing room, her stomach gurgling as it rebelled against the breakfast she'd gulped down just minutes earlier. About a dozen of the twenty or so chairs were occupied, and not seeing anyone she wanted to sit with, she sat in a chair at the end of a row. Over the next couple of minutes, stragglers scurried in to fill a few more seats. She checked the time, six hundred hours on the mark. Jasmine, a camp instructor whose tough persona stood in contrast with her petite frame, strode through the door and marched to the front of the room. Sid slipped in like a shadow behind Jasmine and plopped into the chair next to Cheryl. Good afternoon, Cheryl said to him, keeping her eyes forward and wondering if her unveiled sarcasm pierced his consciousness. Dressed in the all-black, form-fitting athletic suit popular with instructors, Jasmine began the briefing. Today marks the first day of week three. She crossed her arms behind her and made a show of studying the group. You've been through a rotation of partners and a series of challenges. Six of you are clustered at the top with outstanding scores. That will change for at least four of you this morning. Cheryl snuck a glance at Sid, who was slumped in his chair with his eyes closed. He seemed to be scowling. Checking her comm for team assignments, she learned they were partners for the day. They were also two of the six with top scores. 
Will you be awake by the time this starts? She whispered to him. His scowl turned to a smile, but his eyes remained closed. Today's task is simple, folks, said Jasmine. The theater has been staged with the layout of a space freighter. You are to start from the ship's command bridge and make your way to the engine room. The clock stops when you cross the engine room threshold. Shortest time wins. A hand went up in front of Cheryl. It was Chi, a middling talent in this year's class. Do both team members have to cross the threshold, or is it just the first one to cross? Good question. Cheryl looked at Jasmine. Clock stops when the first one crosses. Jasmine paused, adding drama to her next words. Of course, three opposing teams will spread out throughout the ship, and they'll be hell-bent on stopping you from getting there. Looking down at her lecture panel, she said, Check your column for your offense and defense schedules. Cheryl scanned the room and counted 18 people, not counting Jasmine, then looked at her column. There are nine teams total. We're on defense for runs one, two, and five, she whispered to Sid. We're the last team to make our scoring run. Jasmine watched the group with an impassive expression, and Cheryl imagined her counting seconds in her head. After most of a minute, she resumed her instruction. There's an extra twist to our exercise this morning. Last week, we upgraded the simulation capability inside the theater with a third-generation smart crystal. This model supposedly brings artificial intelligence to a whole new level. The techs who installed it swear this AI crystal has a reasoning ability like that of a human. She looked up at the ceiling, the way one might when addressing a disembodied presence. Three Gen, it's your show. The head and shoulders of a clean-cut, forty-year-old man appeared as a lifelike three-dimensional image floating above Jasmine's lecture panel. Hello, everybody. The Three Gen smiled as it scanned the room with its eyes. Jasmine looked at the group. The crystal will manage the competition today. You may ask it questions for the next twenty minutes. Chi's hand shot up and Jasmine acknowledged him. The teams who go later will know what works on offense. Doesn't that give them an advantage? I will be changing the ship's layout after every challenge, replied the crystal. Strategies that are successful for one team may not be so for another, and may even prove detrimental to a winning outcome. Hands raised across the room, and the next question sought hints and information useful in the upcoming challenge. Not bad, Cheryl thought as the AI answered them all without divulging any secrets. The tempo of questions slowed and she raised her hand. You've surely analyzed possibilities and know the likely winners. Won't you be tempted to tweak the competition so your predictions become prophecy? No, said the crystal. A moment passed, and then Cheryl realized that that was its complete answer. Before she could follow up, Jasmine clapped her hands. Time's up, people. Let's move down the hall to staging. Tables arrayed with munitions and gadgets lined the staging area outside the theater. Jasmine had explained that the armaments were set to dummy mode, but in the theater, the crystal would use projected image enhancements to make everything seem real. Cheryl picked up two fleet-issued firearms and slapped one on each wrist, then hefted an energy cannon and returned it to the table. What are you bringing? Sid slapped a firearm on each wrist, the distinctive snap punctuating his words. My secret weapon. She eyed him, waiting for him to expand on the cryptic remark, but he acted like he didn't notice. Moving to the end of the row of tables, he sat on a packaging crate near the wall. She selected several items, distributed them among her pockets, and sat next to him. They watched their competition sort through the weapons, and then they waited for the action to begin. They were on the defense in the first round, and Sid, quote-unquote, killed both members of a top-ranked team in under a minute. They weren't on the schedule when the other top-ranked team took their turn, and one of them made it across the engine room threshold in 6 minutes and 11 seconds. Teams rotated in and out of the theater as the morning progressed, and Sid and Cheryl returned to their crate whenever they weren't part of the action. As their time on offense approached, Cheryl's nervous anticipation grew. Want to hear something pathetic? She asked, picking an imagined piece of lint off her sleeve. Two years ago, I told my dad I wanted to be captain of a fleet ship by the time I was 35. He said it was impossible. No one had ever done it. She caught Sid's eye. I want to win today, to stay on track for that goal. You're here to prove something to your dad? There's no deep psychology, Dr. Freud, she said, shaking her head. My dad and I are great friends. It's just that we bet a bottle of scotch on the captain thing. He gloats so much when he wins. So, you're doing this for a bottle of scotch? It depends. What kind? She laughed and bumped her leg against his. I'm having fun, Sid. This is where I want to be. He nudged her leg in return. No worries, then. We got this. Their names were called, and Cheryl's heart raced as she led the way into the theater. 
The spaceship was staged as a combination of real physical objects, floors, doors, consoles, and chairs, enhanced by three-dimensional projected images. The projections were sophisticated tricks of light that added lifelike illusions of reality. The crystal would use image projection to update the set as events unfolded. Moving behind the ship's main operation bench, the starting point for their run, she exhaled through pursed lips, seeking to dispel the tension from her body. Six minute ten wins it, she said as she primed her wrist weapons. They lowered themselves to the deck and sat back against the ops bench, their shoulders touching as they waited for the horn that would signal the start of the clock. Tilting sideways, Cheryl peered around the corner and surveyed the room. For their run, the command bridge was configured with a navigation bench and a communication bench positioned halfway to their first goal, either of the two passageways that led off the bridge. She eyed each passageway entrance in turn. They start us off pinned down, and our only way out is through choke points. She sat up straight and looked at Sid. They're waiting for us in those corridors. Yep, said Sid, folding his hands in his lap and closing his eyes. She nudged him. The horn is about to sound. We got this, he said for the second time. Before she could respond, the clock started. Cheryl peeked around the corner. I'm going to try for the nav bench. She rose up into a squat and poked her head out. A fusillade of energy bolts, bright but harmless, passed all around her. Jerking back in reflex, she fell behind the ops bench and sprawled on the deck, her head landing on Sid's thigh. How's it going? He asked, looking down at her. I'm confused. She raised up on her elbows. What are you doing? Maybe we shouldn't try for the passageways. What are we going to do? Go through the walls? He winked, then leaned forward and kissed her on the lips. Cheryl shoved his shoulder and wiped her mouth with the back of her hand. Seriously? That's where your head's at? She rose to a crouch and looked him in the eye. You should have asked first. Shuffling to the corner of the ops bench, she used her calm to look around the corner. So, where's your secret weapon? I'm looking at her. Stop with the game, Sid. She let her tone reflect her determination. I told you this was important to me. Digging into her weapon cache, she pulled out a red demolition disc and a blue smoke disc. She knew the wall behind her would be part of the outer hole of a real ship. All paths forward required that they move toward their opponents. Right or left wall? Right. She glanced over at him. So, I'm going alone? He nodded. There's a team waiting in each of those passageways. If I stay here, they will too. For a while, anyway. That means it's you against two. You can beat those odds. With time short and options limited, her adrenaline-driven frenzy transitioned into a clock-slowing calm. I can do this. Setting the discs on the deck in front of her, she armed the smoke disc. She counted to five as she scanned the bridge and then armed the demo disc. Sliding her arm in a smooth motion, she sent the smoke disc skimming across the deck, cheating it toward the passageway entrance on the right. A pop signaled its detonation, and as smoke clouded the far end of the command bridge, she thrust the demolition disc at the right wall. Boom. She'd pulled back and taken cover, but the noise and bright flash still caused her to blink. Peering around the edge of the ops bench, she squinted through the growing haze. The crystal had updated the projected image of the ship. A large, jagged hole was visible in the right wall. She rose, crouched at the edge of the bench, and readied for a dash. The acrid smell of smoke gave a surreal quality to the drama. Good luck she heard as she pushed off and sprinted for the opening. Energy bolts landed all around her, determined to get through the hole as fast as possible. She returned fire during her dash, but didn't take time to aim. The thickening smoke and Sid's cover fire bought her the precious seconds she needed. When she was two body lengths from the right wall, she lifted her arm and dove head first through the opening. Tucking a shoulder, she rolled once and let her momentum bring her to her feet. She understood from the narrow walls that she was in a side passageway. Engine room is down and aft. Dashing away from the bridge, she searched for a route to her goal. She approached a turn in the passageway and slowed. Sidling up to the corner, she bobbed her head forward and snapped back. Then processed the memory of her glimpse. Empty. She looked back the way she'd come and saw no sign of pursuit. Nice work, Sid. Turning to the corner, she stepped into an alcove that held a ladder leading down through a hole in the floor. She grasped the vertical rails in her hand, took a short hop, and pinched the outside of the rails with her feet, squeezing to control the speed of her fall. Craning her neck for signs of danger, she hit the lower deck with a solid thump and resumed her sprint aft. There were two people between here and the engine room. She knew that was a bold assumption, and she should prepare for other scenarios, but with time growing short, restraint wasn't a winning strategy. And, for reasons she couldn't explain, she wanted to live up to Sid's confidence in her. Focus, she thought, scolding herself for letting her attention drift. 
Looking ahead, she saw the hallway had two branches exiting off to the right before dead ending at a wall. She stopped at the corner of the first branch and snuck a peek. Clear. Peering down the side branch as she raced past, she proceeded to be a short connector that linked to a broad, brightly lit corridor. The second branch loomed, and she edged up to the corner and stole a glimpse. It too was empty, and like the other, it connected to the same lighted corridor. Moving into that second branch, she crept to the end and used her calm to survey the scene. Looking right, she detected the arched opening for the first branch she'd passed. Her heart rate spiked when, to her left, she saw the distinctive shape of a muscular blast door. The engine room! Studying the layout in that direction, she identified a half dozen cubbies and corners along its length. They're waiting for me somewhere in those hidey holes. With limited options, she scurried back to the first branch, the one farthest from the engine room, and moved to the end near the brightly lit corridor. Dropping to one knee, she retrieved her last demolition disc and smoke disc, set them on the deck, armed them, and retreated for cover. Time slowed as she waited for the detonation. Boom. Moving into the blast zone, she surveyed the damage through the thickening haze. The smoke disc, now resting in the middle of the broad corridor, hissed like an angry snake as it spewed dense fumes into the confined space. This either works or it doesn't. With the opaque cloud as her protection, she stepped into the corridor, pressed her back against the wall, and waited. The thick smoke tested her. Tears streamed down her face, and she blinked repeatedly in a vain attempt to soothe her stinging eyes. Her throat and lungs burned from the harsh vapors. Lifting the front of her shirt over her nose and mouth, she fought the urge to cough. Resolute in this course of action, she counted seconds as she battled impatience, doubt, and pain. Voices. Drifting toward her from the direction of the engine room, she strained to hear the words. Do you think they blew themselves up? Asked one. It sounded like Seth. They'd been partners in a challenge earlier in the week, and she'd enjoyed the experience. You go straight, said the other. I'll swing across and come around from the back. Cheryl smiled. Yes. She lifted her weapons and, taking deliberate strides down the hall, moved toward her opponents. Materializing from the cloud, she imagines herself as the mythical phoenix rising from the ashes. She nodded at Seth as she hurried past him, his glowing suit signaling his death. Reaching the mouth of the second branch, she shot Seth's partner before he even knew of a threat. Then, her reflexes kicked in. Taking steps that lengthened with each pump of her arms, she sprinted down the hall. She didn't know if more danger lurked ahead, but at this point, it didn't matter. This was her make-or-break play for the win. Reaching the blast door, she coated it open and stepped across the threshold. A display inside showed the elapsed time. Five minutes and eighteen seconds. She hadn't just beaten the other team, she'd crushed them. Lifting her arms over her head, she shuffled her feet and swiveled her hips in an impromptu happy dance. Exhilarated, she wanted to share her joy. Exiting the engine room, she started a slow jog through the theater and back to the command bridge. Seth gave her a good-natured smile, and they slapped hands as she passed. Reaching the bridge, she flashed a broad grin at Sid and performed an abbreviated happy dance. She sensed a somber mood lurking beneath his smile and stopped celebrating, letting her arms drop to her sides. He stepped to her, studied her face as he moved a wayward strand of her hair off her forehead, then enveloped her in his arms. She stiffened as her rational thoughts battled her emotional desires. Don't be stupid. Ignoring her well-honed defensive mechanism, she hugged him back. We did it, she said. You did it, Sid whispered in her ear. They sat on a corner of the ops bench, and she recounted the details of her winning run, enjoying his undivided attention from start to finish. What motivates you to throw this on my shoulders? She asked as they walked out of the theater together. My intuition. I've been trusting my gut instincts more and more. He put his arm around her and gave her a squeeze. I'm on an amazing lucky streak. So far, anyway. She looked up at him. What does your gut say about our time here at camp? Before he could answer, Captain Dooley came around the corner, eyeing them as he approached. Alright, like I said, I'll be bringing you the second part here tomorrow, so make sure to stay tuned. Do you guys like these bonus episodes? I want to hear from you guys. So let me know. All the links are down in the description for how to get in touch with me. If you or somebody that you know is an indie author and would like to have your work read on this podcast, I would love to talk with you, see if it's a good fit for the podcast. So go ahead and get in touch with me. Again, all the links are down in the description. Another great way to help support the podcast is maybe to consider donating. And if you can't do that, maybe consider helping me edit the podcast. That's what takes the most amount of time and if uh, I could find somebody who would volunteer to edit, then uh, that would free me up to be able to produce even more content for you guys. So if that's something you're interested, in, let me know. Love to hear from you. But if you don't want to do any of that, then all that I ask is you just tell somebody about the podcast. Maybe, you know, grab their phone and subscribe for them. They'll thank you later. And with that, we'll talk to you guys tomorrow.
Don't worry, you aren't the only one. You aren't the only business that needs help. You aren't the only person that has a hard time finding the right help at the right price. This is where Business Bloodline becomes your bloodline to temporary and permanent staffing. Business Bloodline specializes in hiring internet workers to creatively solve problems for your business. Business Bloodline does all the vetting and only delivers candidates that make sense for your needs and at a cost that you can afford. But 60 seconds isn't enough for me to tell you why hiring through Business Bloodline is safer, cheaper, and less time consuming. We would rather show you. To get more information or a business consultation, visit businessbloodline.com. If the job can be done on a computer, Business Bloodline can find a match. Visit businessbloodline.com and tell them that you heard about it on Another World Audiobooks to get 10% off your first hire. Remember to mention that you heard about it on Another World Audiobooks to get that 10% off. Businessbloodline.com